now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Friday, March 4th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the webcast on person-centered planning, services considerations, and flexibility, support services, residential supports, state funding, and self-direction. On the panel today, we have Rachel White, Eastern Shore Regional Office Deputy Director, Linda Yale, Western Maryland Regional Office Deputy Director, Karen Lee from SEEK, Executive Director, Jennifer Metrick, Penmar, Chief Strategy Officer, Alan Sheehan, Abilities Network, Chief Programs Officer, Jane Radar, MMRs, Inc., Senior Coordinator of Community Services and um, Rhonda Workman, Director of Federal Programs and Integrity, and Patricia Sestoki, Director of DDA Services. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode in this webcast, and we have um, only one option, um, and that is uh, by computer to listen to the webinar. Uh, there is there is a handout for this webinar, but we do not have it loaded, um, but we will make it available after the webinar. Um, and we are recording the webinar and posting that on YouTube and the DDA website. So if you have questions, they can be typed in the question or chat box in the webinar panel, and we will get toward we'll, we'll get to those towards the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to turn it over to Rhonda Workman. Good afternoon, Rhonda. Good afternoon, Donna. Thank you. Can you go to the next slide, please? So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rhonda Workman, and as Donna mentioned, I am the Director of Federal Programs and Integrity. This is the second DDA training related to person center planning service considerations and flexibilities. The DDA conducted a webinar on February 25th related to meaningful day service considerations and flexibilities that is posted on our website. We have also included the link on the resource slides at the end of this presentation. Today's training and discussion will focus on those support services and residential support flexibilities within the LTSS Maryland system for service delivery and billing once transition. Every participant's plan should reflect all assessed services and supports in their current person center plan even if the provider transition to LTSS fee-for-service billing will not occur until the future. So we want to take these actions now. We will also touch base today on state-funded services and guidance related to self-direction. We're excited about having the, another opportunity to share and discuss how to operationalize the various flexible services and strategies that are available to our coordinators and community services and providers as they help to create individualized person-centered plans. Our purpose today, again, similar to last week, is to ensure comprehensive and flexible person-centered plans, provider business models and infrastructure strategies um, being considered, support providers transition to the fee-for-service billing, we're going to review those processes and share some service reminders. And um, we'll hear from our early adopter and um, coordinator of community services on some of their strategies, lessons learned, and advice. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today, and we value your time. And as we shared last week, we know everyone is extremely busy, and we again hope that you will be able to close emails, move away from distractions so you can actively listen and share questions in the question box. Questions from last week's webinar and today's will be reviewed for inclusion in the DDA's frequently asked questions that is posted on our website. Next slide, please. Don, if you can go to the next slide. Great, so our agenda, um, as noted here, is we will briefly touch on some of the trajectory information that we shared last week. We will share service consideration and flexibilities related to support services, residential supports, 
state funding and self-direction guidance. Jane will share some of the coordinators of community services advice. And Karen, Jen, and Alan will be sharing some provider advice. And again, as Donna mentioned, we will conclude with answering questions. Next slide, please. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel White, and I am the DDA Eastern Shore Regional Office Deputy Director. As shared during our February 24th webinar, people are the center of planning a vision for their personally defined good life. This is done through person-centered planning. As per our community of practice, before considering services, it is important for coordinators of community services and providers working in partnerships with the person and their team members to engage in pre-planning and team meetings, to share updates, progress toward outcomes, current or no new needs, challenges, and risk. As noted in our PCP development and authorization guidance and webinars, there are several person-centered planning tools and strategies that may be used in helping each participant to consider their personal strengths, assets, gifts, and wishes across the life domains and over the lifespan. Person-centered planning is a continual process of listening and learning to create a meaningful and relevant plan that may be adjusted according to life circumstances. This includes discovery actions, such as discussing focus areas as identified by the participant and included in the PCP, as well as outcomes the participant wants to accomplish initially and throughout the PCP year. After the participant's vision has been identified, the PCP team should utilize the HRST and other tools and discussions to assess support need, including any that have changed or have not been met, and identify healthcare needs risks and mitigation strategies. Next slide, please. All people need supports to lead good lives. Using a combination of different kinds of supports helps to map out a trajectory towards an inclusive, quality community life. Utilizing the integrated support star in planning helps people and their families to think about how to work in partnerships to support a person's vision for their good life. Considering technology, personal strengths, relationships, community resources, and eligibility-specific services lead to a different way of thinking and planning. These types of conversations encourage higher expectations and integrate lots of different kinds of supports, not just eligibility specific supports like the DDA operated Medicaid waiver programs. After exploration of generic, natural, community, local, and other resources, the PCP team should determine if any remaining unmet support needed can only be met with a waiver or Medicaid service. This slide as an example of an integrated support star used to plan for behavioral supports. Next slide, please. This is an example of an integrated support star mapped out for personal supports. Next slide, please. The DDA operated Medicaid waiver programs include various flexible services to support full active participation, and membership of one's community. This slide shows the variety of support services to support independent living and community engagement. Next slide, please. This slide gives you an example of a PCP detailed service authorization section with multiple services to support independence and community integration, including assistive technology and services, transportation, respite, and personal supports. To support service flexibility, some services are based on 15-minute units. Some have an upper pay limit like camp and transportation that can be reflected 
with an annual service cost and check marks in each month. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for the wonderful information, Rachel. Um, this um, this uh, slide really represents our communication with the early adopters that we have on the call today. And so we're just gonna have a dialogue with uh, Jane, Karen, Jennifer, and Alan. Um, so um, Jane, can you share how you work with a person in their team and understand the various support services options available that can help support the person's vision, independence, community engagement, um, and as applicable, address some of those risks. Um, and then maybe how you guys have used the integrated support star or tools that you're using uh, to do that as a case manager. Sure, Patricia. Uh, as a CCS, my main role is to guide, provide the list of DDA waiver service definitions to the person and their family. I would explain to the person of each service, support services, which include personal support, transportation, behavioral, uh, assistant technology, and so on. Um, those lists to the, in, the person that I serve and their family, and then um, let's see if it applies to the person's needs. During the pre-planning meeting, I will gain knowledge of the person's vision about the services they want to request, then assist with completing the draft PCP. If the support, um, services does not tied into the DDA waiver definition after um, discussing with the person. Uh, I could also refer them or redirect them for services through CFC doors or other state funded services. Then um, once they decided that they are interested in personal support, um, I will request the DDA services like, um, like the ones that I listed before. Then I'll assist the person and the family to create a weekly schedule, which would be written in the scope of the DSA um, meeting minutes when completing the PCP packet. The scope would give an in-depth explanation of why the person needs the service, a description of what activities the person will be doing with staff assistance, how the services would en enhance the person's activities of daily living, how the person can be in an integrated community inclusive, while receiving the support services that's being requested. A vision of what the person wants their day to look like and how the direct care staff can assist the person to have a quality life that fits the person's needs. The frequency of when each service will be provided following the entire physical year. Thank you so much for that. I'm so glad you mentioned the, the pre-planning because it's so critical and it brings about what um, you know, what Rachel talked about. Um, Alan, um, how did you start having a conversation with your team when discussing support services? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, we, um, it, it really starts with having a uh, discussion and, and supporting team members and staff of your organization to be really clear on the purpose of your services, what the trajectory of your services are. Um, so for instance, um, providing certain services might be to help a person to be as independent as possible. And when staff um, have that knowledge and can walk into situations based on their experience with the person, they can really help highlight different aspects of their life that may need to be addressed to accomplish whatever it is uh, they're trying to accomplish. Um, so as an example, um, when talking with the team, it's real important to discuss beyond just one service, job development, personal support. Because of the way the service models are set up now, there's really a full array of aspects you can look at meeting for a person's life. Um, and in one instance, uh, there's a gentleman we support who um, received personal supports. And um, our goal was to help him become more independent, more tied to the community. And uh, what we looked at for him was uh, he shared he needed uh, help with prompters or with remembering appointments, sorry. And um, so what we did was uh, we put in a goal for assistive technology, working with the CCS, where the CCS is doing some research. And then we're gonna come in and provide support um, with um, different assistive technology that the person may use for, um, to, uh, for prompting and different reminders. We've also connected them to transportation services to support independently accessing places in the community or in the past he really relied on staff 
to take him to um, different events and, and whatnot in the community. And then of course, personal supports. And what this did, which was, which was really cool, was it, it took his experiences, staff's knowledge and the CCS's experience, and it created really the opportunity to share all different perspectives to determine, okay, what are, what is, what's the gamut of supports needed to help this person to be most successful and most independent? And coming in with that framework, that, that mindset is so critical to look beyond just an immediate service, but really at the person's life using that trajectory and then determining, okay, this is where they wanna to get to, what are some of the services needed? So you're almost working kind of like reverse engineering, working backwards from where they wanna to get to, to identify those services to support them. Thank you, Alan, really appreciate that. I'm glad you talked about the partnership between your agency and the CCS. Um, let's do Karen. Can you share some of that? And then right after that, we'll go to Jennifer. Karen? Sure. You want to advance the slide? I think I have the next, uh, there's a graphic there. So, um, you know, I, what I think about when I think about being an early adopter and, and the moves to the new service definitions is, if you're old enough to remember the mover, movie Sister Act and Who Whoopi Goldberg walks into a room where there's all these people who are very staid and you know it's kind of a, a really boring choir and she says, my friends, this is a brand new day. And that's exactly how we think of these supports at SEEK is we finally have this incredible array of services that we can offer people. We don't have to keep doing the same things we've been doing over and over again. By having these discrete services, the way that, that they've been set up by the, the vision of DDA, um, we really can get people right where they're at and right where they want. AT services, behavior supports, nursing supports, personal supports, all of those things that we can, we can wrap around. We have so much flexibility. So we started off with a very boring 13 page document that talked about all the definitions and the price and all of that. And after a long time, we moved into this. We moved into this one page. Steve Blanks, our visionary partners director at, here at SEEK uh, came up with this as, as just a single page visual for all the services that folks can do. So, you know, I wanna re, um, uh, re support the notion that pre-planning it's not like it used to be. It's it's pre-planning is not a time to go, okay, what were the goals last year? What are the goals? This is a time to have those really rich conversations about what do you really want for your life this year? Where do you want to go? And now we've got all these little pieces we could put together to help a person have that. A few hours of this, a couple hours of that, the technology to help them get there. Um, and you might need a different infrastructure. We talked about that a little bit in the past. Um, in last week's webinar, you might need a different infrastructure as an organization to implement this new kind of service, this new way of thinking, this new way of giving people the flexibility and opportunity that you and your staff for a long time have been talking about. Wouldn't it be great if we could? Well, now you can, and this is the opportunity um, to do that. So this is just a visual and, and a picture of some of those services. I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail later about <clears throat> some of those specific services. But uh, back to you, Patricia, if you wanna advance thank the Jen's slide. Yep, thank you, Karen. So, um, so Jennifer? Yes, thank you. Hi, this is Jennifer Metric from Penmar. And one of the things that we have been incorporating into our pre-planning process is the charting the life course tools because we knew that many of our partner CCSs were also using those as the basis of planning and we wanted to come into alignment with that and really be able to talk the same language and look at the pre-planning process together in the same way. So one of the things that we've really liked about the particularly the integrated STAR tool is you can see where people are at now. So you're looking at a particular outcome or goal that someone's trying to reach, and then you're looking at, 
okay, who in their um, in their community or within their relationships already supports them along that goal? Who are some of those natural supports? What kinds of technology are they currently using? What kinds of kind technology could they use moving forward that we could potentially build into their plan? This is, this is the way that we're having that conversation so that we can look for gaps in which more formalized services like some of the support services can be utilized to really help people um, be able to move them further in their life tra trajectory and meet some of those short-term goals. So one example is around assistive technology. This is something that we really have been learning as an early adopter, that we need to be more intentional around the kinds of assistive technology that we're able um, to offer and support as part of this process. So we actually um, were able to utilize some grant funding to start an assistive technology position where we are going to be able to get that person trained and certified and um, have them be part of that PCP um, pre-planning process so that they're able to do assessments on the kinds of technology that'll make sense um, for the specific person um, around their specific goals. And then that, that assistive technology coordinator will also be able to come alongside that person and their team um, to teach them how to use the different kinds of assistive tech, whether that's low tech, high tech, there's lots of different options out there, um, and be able to check in on a regular basis on is this really meeting um, their goals for greater independence or let's say um, helping them to obtain and keep employment. So those are the kinds of things that we're hoping um, to be able to get out of that and has just been a great learning opportunity as, as we've looked at some of the new services that are available. Wow, thanks, Jennifer. It sounds really great. Love the, how you guys use the integrated start. You know, really hopefully some providers and CCS is listening will really take some of those examples and make that move forward. Um, so thank you. Uh, Linda, do you want to then walk us through some personal supports? Next slide, please. So, hi, my name is Linda Yale, and I'm the Western Maryland Regional Office Deputy Director. Um, as you are aware, personal support service um, provides habilitative services to assist participants live in their own home um, or in their family homes and acquire or build um, some additional skills that are necessary to maximize their independence. Some of these services include um, home skills development, um, also community integration, engagement skills. Um, personal supports are available before and after school, anytime when school is not in session, during the day when meaningful day services are not provided, and on nights and weekends. Next slide, please. The DDA has also shared as part of the last waiver amendment that personal supports include both in-person and virtual support delivery models. Direct support professional services may be provided also in an acute care hospital for the purpose of supporting that person's um, behavioral and communication and assist them in those um, settings. This cannot be duplicative of a hospital or a short-term institutional service. It really has to be that personal support um, level of care. These services provided during an acute care hospital stay, like I said, must be um, documented in the PCP and also in the service implementation plan. Next slide, please. So very exciting news today, the department issued uh, our personal supports overnight support policy and memo. So that came out today at 11 o'clock. So if you haven't had a chance, make sure that you read that. 
um, effective March 1st, 2022, we are able to provide overnight supports as a component of personal supports in all three of our DDA waivers. This will promote uh, participants' personal independence, assure access to person specific safeguards and skills to ensure health and safety, and it also will promote um, the vital role that the family serves in supporting their loved one. Waiver participants assess needs must demonstrate that there is a behavioral or medical risk that requires that overnight support, and this information must be documented in the current PCP or approved nursing care plan or behavior plan. Um, the personal support service policy reflected in policy stat has been updated to reflect this decision. And DDA will also upset, update all of our other guidances as applicable as well for this. Next slide, please. To support the assessed needs and service flexibilities, teams can consider daily and weekly needs and the schedules for the individuals. Some people may need additional supports during school breaks or summer months. Um, detailed service authorization tool, along with other supporting documentation, is used to help document the type, the amount, and the duration of the service that the person needs. Um, to be supported to achieve their goals and to stay healthy and safe. The CCS can enter these units in the PCP as daily units, weekly units, and on specific days. Um, a lot of times when these units are added, CCSs have been able to share their screens with the providers to help clarify when the services are needed. Um, the providers can't see how that's entered. All they see is the total units. So the sharing between the CCS and the providers as this entry is going on is really important. Um, it's also important to note that regardless of how the units are noted in the CCS planning screen, such as daily or weekly, that the authorized services can be used at any time during the month. The annual PCP process should be used to revise or reassess these needs unless there is a health or safety concern that comes up. Next slide, please. So just some reminders, personal supports provides habilitative service to individuals who live in their own or family homes um, to build additional skills necessary to uh, maximize their independence. This can include home skill development, community integration, engagement in um, skills in the community. It can include overnight supports based on assessed medical and behavioral needs, and the teams can consider daily and weekly needs as they're looking at schedules. Next slide, please. Thanks, Linda, so much for that. Um, now I'm going to ask Jane some questions. And so, Donna, can you bring us to the next slide? Because I want Jane, um, Jane to tell us a little bit about how you go about supporting the person and their team in discussing personal support needs and in entering proposed services in the uh, DSA. Okay, great. My mic was muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so as a CCS, um, when discussing about DDA services, you always have to gain knowledge of other DDA funded services slash support services that the person is currently receiving. So services would not overlap. Um, after obtaining that information, when you discuss with the person and their team to gain knowledge of why the person personal support is needed, always envision personal support as a teachable type of service. When the staff is teaching the person how to be independent to complete tasks that they feel like they're lacking, the CCS can also educate the person about where and when personal support can be provided, which can be um, included but not limited to in home community-based services. Personal support is designed to teach a person how to be independent in the areas they feel that they lack 
or need room for growth. For example, I have a person who wanted to learn how to um, take care of their personal needs, like tying their own shoes, brushing their teeth, shaving like their facial hair, doing laundry, folding uh, uh, their clothes and hanging it, like so sorting their closet, cooking small meals in a microwave or, or stove, which are more of home-based. You can also um, travel train when the person is in the community of interest. Someone wants to learn how to practice their money management skills. You take them to the bank the, the, which the, in the, with the staff. Those are the vision that you're given on the scope of why the service is needed. Um, cashing a check, making purchases at the grocery stores. Staff is there to teach, observe as the person complete the task. After gaining knowledge of the type of personal support is needed, then a, uh, the CCS is there to help the person to create a schedule of how much hours they needed for each week, day. Um, normally, um, as a CCS, as uh, I believe Linda stated, I will share my screen uh, whether I'm dealing with, a, uh, with providers on traditional services or self-direction, just because um, it will show you, you can choose which day um, of the, uh, not, you can choose which month you want what service, if in case someone happens to want to go on a vacation in the month of July, they, they would have less services and say, okay, I only need maybe 10 hours compared to all the other months they need maybe 40 hours a week. Having the person in the team to work with them to create that schedule is highly important. And I would advise as a CCS, always share your screen because we always get that question as to where are these numbers coming from? How is this adding up? But if the, the schedule shows you the week, and you choose um, for each week how much hours you need per day, or if it's twice a week, uh, three times a week, then they're able to see what you're seeing versus you're just informing them. And if you are not able to um, share your screen, maybe contact the LTSS help desk, but I think it's very important. Thank you, Jane, really appreciate that. Um, thank you, I'm so glad you said that you shared your screen because what you see, what you have as a CCS and what the provider sees is quite different. So this is a really good partnership. Um, thank you so much. So Alan, um, can you share a little bit about how you project the needs of personal supports and also consider evening and weekends to meet the needs of the person? And can you give us some examples? Sure. Yeah, one of the uh, with, with personal supports and and uh, many of the other services, uh, it's important to remember that they can be provided in increments. Um, so you can really cut them up however is needed to meet the person's needs. So in thinking about uh, a person's um, day, evenings, weekends, it's looking at okay, what is needed to help them to be uh, successful and to be independent. It could be that you provide a little bit of personal supports in the morning um different service uh during the day and then the evening back to personal supports and just as an example um there uh one person that we support uh in the morning uh we help uh her get ready for work um prepare for the day um sometimes this is provide virtual other times it's provided in person depending on her needs and preference um we'll pick her up uh drive her to work support her at the job site and then the evening uh, will help her with um, going to the bank, meal prep, et cetera. Uh, and the way that it works out in terms of services is we'll provide personal supports in the morning, then we'll provide job support in the, uh, throughout the day, and then in the evening we're back to personal supports. And it's, it's a very uh, smooth way to meet different needs uh, all within the same day without having to change up uh, a, a lot of different pieces of it. We have the same staff person who may work in the morning and then do the job development and then maybe a different staff comes out and does the evening work. Um, but it's really important to remember that they are increment services. You can break them up throughout the day and throughout the week uh, as was shown on the, uh, the DSAT. And um, to use that flexibility to, to really make sure we're meeting people's needs in the best way possible. Thank you, Alan, appreciate that. Um, let's go to Karen's slide so Karen can share how she actually uh, looks at uh, support services. So Karen, you wanna um, share how you do that?
I was talking and of course it was on mute, but sorry about that. Thank you so much. Um, so these are kind of the four ways that we look at personal supports at SEEK. The first is independent living, pretty consistent with what uh, Alan was saying. And um, again, I wanna thank Jane for her wonderful um, comments about sharing her slide because I, just to, as a side, as an early adopter, one of the things that, that I think we all came to realize really early on was that DDA, the CCS and the provider all see different screens in LTSS. And so we think we're talking about the same language and we're not because we're on different. So I love Jane's um, strategy of sharing screens. That was really helpful um, as we partnered with Jane. But back to this. Um, so on the independent living side, it's it kind of makes sense to people, right? Independent living, you know what it is. A great example is Rachel who moved out to her own apartment with a girlfriend and um, she and her roommate were lucky enough to have moms that did all their cooking and planning. So now they moved into their own place and they don't really know how to prepare their meals. So our supports for her are to help her and her roommate plan their menu for the week. They go shopping, they create a shopping list, they go shopping and then they do some meal prep together. And I think that the staff is there maybe three nights a week um, providing that kind of support. They also do some budgeting plan um, activities that they're gonna do. Um, even though the staff might not go with them to those things that they're, she's helping them look for things to do. The community life engagement piece that we use personal supports for are traditionally people who live at home with their family member and they are wanting to have an evening and a weekend that is much richer. So they're, they're wanting to um, meet up with their friends and, and they want to um, you know, go to a play or they may have a church that's different than what their family wants to go to. And that's its intermittent support. I will say these are sometimes very difficult uh, positions to staff because you're looking at short periods of time, not a full shift. Um, and so doing some really creative support around staffing and where you do your recruitment for these is critical. The next is this moving out course, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done on this. Um, so SEEK got a grant from the Arc of Maryland through the SPARK grant and created this six month course for people who live at home with their parents and are ready to move out or people who have lived in group homes and are interested in moving out. And um, as Jen talked about, the core of this is charting the life course. And we use the trajectory and the integrated star and people start really thinking about what it is that they want. It's like a transition program for, for living in the same way like project searches for employment. Um, it's done virtually and we do people, we do um, a lot of discussion and there's a curriculum that we created with this and um, it's there's homework in between and we're hoping that by January of 2023 to be able to offer this statewide to anybody who who's interested in this. Um, I know that many parents of people who don't receive DDA services are thinking this would be a good thing for my kid too. Um, it's a it's a great curriculum. And then the other thing is um, a little bit the moving out preparation. So let's say you live at home with mom and dad and mom and dad are thinking, you know, I'd like him to go out, but I'd really like him to be able to do his laundry before he moves. And I'd like for him to be able to uh, cook his own meals. And I wanna make sure he knows how to um, get himself to bed or get himself up in the morning. So it might be that kind of support, the support that helps parents feel a little bit more comfortable about skill sets that people have getting ready to move out. So those are really the four primary ways that we use personal supports at Seek. Thank you, Karen, so much for that. Um, so um, Jennifer, do you wanna talk a little bit about the personal supports uh, versus the community development services? Sure. Um, similar to um, what Alan and Karen both shared around how they're utilizing personal supports and looking at it in terms of the full array of services that are available, we looked at, we're looking at personal supports in a little bit different way than we did when we were operating in PCIS2, where before 
we may have supported a couple of people through personal supports to meet up in the community evenings and weekends and be able to do some of those community-based activities that they wanted to do like we have a thursday night bowling group that likes to to go out every thursday night and spend the evening together and so we realized in this new service array and the new types of services available with CDS supports, you're able to provide CDS supports um, group or one-to-one -one evenings and weekends, as well as during the day. So we have shifted um, many people that were using personal supports in that old model to CDS supports moving forward. And then we've really focused our personal supports on that skill building aspect, similar to what Karen um, was talking about with independent living or preparing to potentially move into supported living and being able to live independently, but with a certain level of support. And so this is how we've been able to look at just tweaking those services. So what are the ones that are really going to meet the needs of the person best um, and looking for that wraparound approach. Similar to Alan, we look at personal supports um, to help people in the mornings and afternoons um, after or before they have been um, participating in any kind of our day learning services, um, whether that's day habilitation or CDS groups. So hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer. That's really wonderful. You guys are, are full of resources. Thank you. So Linda, you wanna walk us through the next slide on behavior supports? Hey, Patricia, it's Rachel, it's my turn. So we're going to oh, talk sorry, about. Rachel. That's okay. Um, we're going to talk about behavioral supports, and um, this is a bit of a mouthful, so bear with me. Behavioral strategies are based on a multi-tiered approach. Tier one includes providing positive interactions, choice making, and predictable and proactive settings or environments. Tier two focuses on social, communication, emotional, and physiological intervention or therapies, mobile crisis teams, and behavioral respite based on trauma-informed care. Tier three is the use of restrictive techniques based on a functional behavioral assessment and approved strategies developed in the behavior plan. Brief support implementation services or BSIS, or a time-limited provision of direct assistance, modeling, and training to the individuals who are supporting the participant, their families, their direct support professionals, and paid or unpaid caregivers, so that they can implement the participant's behavior plan independently. BSS behavioral assessment and BSS behavior plan milestone services can be checked for each month to support the flexibility in service delivery and the provider's ability to bill in the actual month that the service was provided. BSS brief support implementation and BSS behavioral consultation services in 15-minute units can be projected across the entire plan year to support the participant's needs and service flexibility. Next slide, please. It's important to consider potential monthly consultation units needed in addition to scheduled reviews in the case of an emergency or off-cycle review. And remember that more units are used when the annual plan is updated. Some individuals have holiday triggers and may require more consultation added during those times of the year. This is an example of a DSA with each month checked for behavioral assessment and behavior plan to support service flexibility and projected behavioral consultation and BSIS needs during the month. Next slide, please. To support behavioral assessment and behavior plan provision, each month can be checked to support the flexibility and service delivery and the provider's ability to bill in the actual month that the service was provided. 
BSIS services are a time-limited provision of direct assistance, modeling, and training to individuals supporting the participant, their families, direct support professionals, and paid and unpaid caregivers so they can implement the participant's plan independently. BSIS and BCS services are built in 15-minute units and can be projected across the entire plan year for people in traditional service delivery model only to support the participant's needs and provide a service flexibility. Next slide, please. Thank you, Rachel, so much for that. Um, I like right now to ask Jane um, if you can share how you go about supporting the person and their team and discussing you know, the behavior support needs. Yes. As a CCS, when discussing about behavior support needs, it's important to understand the person's risk, behaviors, restrictions, and the type of incident they have had to have a really good team discussion and see if a behavior plan and support are needed or if they have a plan that is working. It's also very important to explore what the person is communicating with their behavior and if there is an underlining or unmet need, we have to not explore that behavior support services can assist and improve the quality of the life of the person. So um, I think uh, for an example, I had a meeting where um, the provider wants to request um, a two to one services. And um, the first discussion will be, okay, have you looked at the behavior um, services? And they said, oh, um, no one has come back. The behavior, the person that wrote the behavior plan hasn't come back to review it, to even know if the behavior plan is actively working. Um, some behave, some individuals who are a uh, person who are hearing voices or has new behavior, have you spoken to the psychiatrist? You know, look at all the other researches and then you can bring all of that information into the, um, the team to then request a behavior um, service with the behavior providers. With um, self-directed um, people that we serve, we also have to inform them that a person can only request um, behavior vendor providers through the DDA licensed behavioral um, agencies, because that's another um, miscommunication that's always not clearly understood. So as the CCS, it's our responsibility to educate our family of what providers are there to request the service and then also collect enough data to show support and document when requesting a behavior service. Thank you, Jane, so much. Um, Jennifer, do you want to share what your agency is doing with uh, supporting people uh, who may uh, be exhibiting challenging behaviors? Um, yes. So one of the things that we try to do first and foremost, because we don't at, currently, we at Penmar don't have internal um, behavioral specialists that are able to support us through this process and can really match um, our values and how we look at behavior. And so oftentimes we have to contract out for behavioral assessment and support at this time. And so we like to do some work ahead of that to try to avoid it um, if we can. And then if we're still having challenges, then we'll move um, into a place where we'll, we'll do that contractual work um, with a behavioral specialist. But we really try to focus on what is the person's behavior? Um, what are they trying to communicate? As Jane noted, what are those unmet needs that people are are not having filled and how can our supports change or alter to be able to meet that need so that we're seeing less of those behavioral challenges on a regular basis. We do a lot with designing communication plans when someone expresses this particular behavior, this is what we've learned that, that they're trying to communicate to us um, in ways that they might not be doing verbally. And so we have that and then we try to train our team members that are working with the specific individuals around what some of those communications are. And when they're seeing certain things, this is how to best support somebody to either prevent 
a behavioral incident or to be able to help the person de-escalate um, as they're as they're having um, that behavior. So we've we're at the core of everything is our MANT training and really using um, the hierarchy of needs to make sure that we are meeting everybody's needs. Um, especially at those base levels and then beyond so that we're helping people um, to not to be able to express their needs and and the kinds of supports they need in in a way that isn't going to exert and kind of more of those explosive behaviors or things that are going to be of of safety concern um, and then from there if if we need to move down the road of um, reaching out to a behavioral specialist and designing a plan will do so. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, um, Donna, let's go to the next slide and, and ask the uh, same question to uh, Karen. Thanks, Patricia. Um, so we all are, we're, we're sounding a little bit like a, a broken record. We all use a lot of the same practices. And I think that, um, it's it's so great to have colleagues that are that are on the same page and, and working um, really side by side on a lot of this. So SEEK does actually provide behavioral support services. We have two RBTs, the registered behavior technicians. We have consulting psychologists. Um, a lot of use a lot of ABA. Um, these are kind of the components of our um, uh, behavior support. So. We have traditional supports, you know, for people who are on specific medications and have to have behavior supports. But in addition, uh, as a BCDSS provider, SEEK really likes, um, like our colleagues, we like to look at behavior as a form of communication. So someone may be communicating that they don't like their staff or that they don't like uh, part of their day or how their day is scheduled. They may want more control um, and choice in their lives. And so that's, those are the kind of the basic things that we really look at. Uh, in our in our behavior support team. So we have a multidisciplinary approach to supporting people who need some of that extra behavioral support. Our behavior support team along with the DSPs might do something like implement a strategy of posting the staff schedule with staff pictures on it so people know who's coming. That might give them some peace to know. Or they might, um, we might post the person's schedule on the wall uh, with Velcro so that the person can make their own schedule on a daily basis, have more, have more choice and control. Or we might use touchscreen technology like a iPad or iPhone for people to tell their own story and how they want people to work with them. So when anybody new comes into their life, you know, they might have, with a behavior team, they might have created something that says, hi, this is my name. This is what I want you to call me. This is how I want you to address me, how I want you to work with me. We also really consider physical health and wellness as we start looking at uh, behavioral support. So our brilliant BSS team here at SEEK are currently piloting a health and wellness strategy using a physical therapist who works at SEEK um, for two men that we provide some support to and they both get BSS support. But um, we've noticed that because of their lack of physical activity, there is a, there's been a heightened aggression during um, COVID. And so they've created a really great uh, physical fitness um, about increasing their physical fitness, knowing how closely physical fitness, mental health, um, and physical health are tied together. So really looking at not just traditional behavior supports with, uh, with um, uh, some of your traditional things, but really looking at the whole person through the eyes of health and wellness and mental health being a part of that. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you, Karen, so much. I think one of the takeaways that we get from talking to, you know, the providers is that there is um, a lot of resources, the in-house behavior supports like some of you have uh, contracted out, like, you know, PIMR has subcontracted out or even teaming up with other organizations. So that's really a good Good, good strategy. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so Donna, let's go to the next slide and have Linda um, talk to us about nursing support services. All right, so let's talk about nursing support services. As part of our waiver assurances, DDA must look at the health and welfare of individuals and meet their assessed need. So DDA uses the health risk screening tool 
to meet this assurance. This tool does a great job of identifying training needs, risk, and mitigation efforts that should be noted in the person's PCP. The HRSTs also must be updated at least annually, 90 days prior to the PCP. Next slide, please. The HRST can help the team determine the level of nursing supports that may be needed and allows for a registered nurse to meet the health and safety needs of that individual. They can perform um, initial nursing assessments, the HRST clinical reviews, um, medication administration screening tools, and other health needs that an individual may have. Next slide, please. So based on the participant's need, the programs use support, nursing support services in four different ways to support that person. So the first way is as a consultant. Um, the consultant service recommends um, community health resources, helps to develop healthcare protocols, emergency protocols, reviews the communication systems between the individual, the family, the support staff, and others about what they would do when there was an emergency situation related to health. Um, the health case management part of nursing support services, the developing nurse, they help to develop the nursing care plans that help meet the participants' needs, they train the staff on those plans, and they recommend how best to um, meet the, the individual's needs in the community um, and talk to tr and train the uh, direct support staff. Next slide, please. So then we also have health case management with delegation. This one uh, a lot of folks are very familiar with. They develop a nursing care plan to meet the participants' needs, train the staff, include delegating nursing and then train staff on each of those tasks. Um, and they help to monitor that the staff's competency to delegate the task is, is there. Um, they also monitor the participant's health status to make sure that they are doing well and not getting worse. And that if there's any new needs that arise, they can be assessed as well. Next slide. So as you add nursing support services to the PCP, it allows an initial nursing assessment to be completed, and that evaluation will tell you what healthcare needs require nursing care tasks, um, whether those tasks can be delegated um, in accordance with the Maryland Board of Nursing regulations, or if the tasks are exempt from the delegation in accordance with the Maryland Board of Nursing. Next slide, please. Some reminders about nursing support services. Meaningful day and residential services have nursing support services included as part of the rate. So the, those services are included. Um, if a staff is giving medication, then you would need nursing support services in the person's center plan. In the self-directed plans, if you have an HRST of three or higher, we would need nursing support services included in that plan so that the annual nursing reviews can be completed. Um, paid staff cannot clock in and out to administer medications. They must be delegated that task. Next slide, please. Thank you, Linda, appreciate that. Um, so let's have some discussion about our early adopters in the CCS on lessons learned on nursing support services. Jane, do you want to share how you go about doing this and some critical things to consider? Yes. Um, so as a CCS, I would always um, gain knowledge of the person that I serve to see uh, what their needs are. Uh, as um, as Linda stated, if a, if a person is receiving residential and um, 
day services, the nurses' services already included into the cost. So usually I utilize nursing services for my subdirected um, people on my caseload who, uh, when I do the HRST, has like a high case score um, of three and above. And most times they will tell you that it's there. Or if individual, uh, if the person has medical um, needs for to have ongoing like injection and stuff, just get, try your best to collect data um, about what the nursing service is there for. It's just a reminder that just because a person needs a nursing delegated does not mean that the team needs to request a one-to-one -one service under unless they ask uh, specify health care needs just to differentiate the two. Great, thank you. Um, and then Karen and Jennifer, and Karen, if you can start for just to kind of share what were some of the lessons learned and some things that you said, oh, we need to have. And then after you do that, Jennifer, can you just answer the same question? Well, this is definitely uh, my weakest area of knowledge, but I will tell you that um, it was a shift for us because most people we supported um, in their own homes were in personal supports. And as we moved to supported living, um, it, it is a service that is not a standalone service any longer. It is integrated into the work that we do and uh, as a part of, of um, supported living. And so bringing the nurse into the dialogue or into the whole team discussion, including behavioral supports and, and uh, health and wellness and shifting our, our nurses from being kind of um, more of a uh, responsive group instead to have them be proactive and look in health and wellness and working with um, our health and wellness team around that is something that we've, we've really focused on in the last year. Jen? Thanks, Karen. Yeah. And then I would add to that, I would say that we're using the standalone nursing support service mostly for those that are still receiving personal support services. And we uh, we did have in-house nursing um, at one point, and now we've shifted to using um, dimensional healthcare for, for our nursing. But what we needed to do was really make sure, as Karen was noting, that we were partnering with our dimensional nurse to ensure that we were putting the right amount of units into the PCPs as part of the process because you can have your set amount of time to do the nursing assessments and then the training of the staff um, and your regular um, your nursing reviews that you're doing on a 45 day basis, but there's always things that happen. People's um, needs change. And if you're not building in a certain amount of flexibility into the plans for each month, then you're not able to bill for those extra services um, that you're either your in-house or your contracted nurse is providing. So that was a that was a huge lesson learned for us as we got into this, that we made we need to make sure that we're putting in that flexibility in terms of units. And then the other thing that we've been working on is communicating through our data management system. So we're all on the same page. So all of the nursing um, plans are in our database management. We've given our nurses um, access to that system so they can easily put that information in there. They can see the documentation on a daily basis from our DSPs. And then that also helps them to do their 45 day reviews. And it's, it's just a much more coordinated and efficient process than it was when we were doing a lot of pushing paper or exchanging emails and those kinds of things. Wow, those are great lessons, learning advice. Thank you uh, to you both for that. Um, so let's, Rachel, let's talk about some respite on the next slide. Respite is short-term care intended to provide both the family or the primary caregiver and the participant with a break from their daily routines. Respite relieves families or the primary caregivers from their daily caregiving responsibilities. Respite includes services in a DDA licensed residential site, noted as daily units, 
services based on 15 minute units outside of a DDA license site titled respite hourly in the LTSS DFA and CAMP. Next slide, please. This is an example of a DSA illustrating that a person can utilize different types of respite services. To support access and flexibility for respite under the traditional model, a participant's respite daily and hourly services can be combined and requested and authorized by the DDA above the 720 hour limit within each PCP. Similar to the meaningful day service flexibility, participants cannot receive and providers will not be paid for more than the limit for respite daily and hourly services for combined respite services. So you can see that the units across the whole year are higher than what would be authorized. Next slide, please. So reminders are to support respite care services flexibility under the traditional service model, hourly and daily total hours combined can be requested and authorized by the DDA above the 720 hour limit within each PCP. And similar to the meaningful day service flexibility, participants cannot receive and providers will not be paid for more than the limit for respite daily and hourly services combined. The total cost for camp cannot exceed $7,248 within each plan year. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna talk about residential services. So this slide gives you an overview of the residential services. We have community living group home, community living um, enhanced supports, um, and these are provider owned and operated sites. We have shared living, which is based on the adult foster care model and used as a, um, a host home to provide those supports. We have supported living, which is provided in the person's own home and people in self-direction have the budget authority for this service. Please note that all of these residential services are provided in our community pathways waiver. They are not available in our family supports waiver or our community supports waiver. Next slide, please. The transition from PCIS2 to LTSS provides more flexibility and shared hours and more individualized supports. So instead of PCIS2 and matrix and add-ons um, with your residential services, and this is, um, the exception is shared living because that is a rate service, so these flexible shared hours, in addition to the dedicated supports that are added into each person's PCP, really makes for much more individualized services. Agencies are utilizing these flexibilities in many different ways um, to demonstrate the flexibility for each person. And each agency is doing this in a different way based on their business model. So teams should focus on the individual's needs and schedule versus the provider staffing model or backing into the legacy or the matrix process. Next slide, please. All right, our current guidance um, reflects that our flexible shared base hours are based on the size of the home. So in a one to three person home, that's 128 hours that are there for the week to be shared. That includes the awake overnight. Um, in a four to five person home, the hours go up. And then in a six to eight person home, the hours go up to 272 hours that are shared hours in that house. These numbers assume 40 hours of meaningful day each week for an individual. And like I said, the 56 hours of shared overnight supports that can be awake or asleep based on the provider's business model. 
So what you need to know is that DDA is making adjustments um, to these flexible shared base hours um, so that each person's home would have 138 hours instead of the 128. Um, they're going to increase some of those base hours based on the number of people that are added to each house. And the assumption is going to be 30 hours a week of meaningful day service rather than the 40. Um, so these adjustments are going to be made and, and you'll get more information in the future about that um, because it's gonna further support individualized schedules, community integration, decrease the need for requested dedicated support hours. And it's really to incorporate the feedback from the stakeholders and the preliminary fiat review. Now, the important thing to take away is that you do not need to redo the PCP. Um, you can redo your PCP at the annual planning process or at the next time that you're changing it for something else because the hours that you've put into the PCP, you will only bill for the hours that you need. So as DDA looks at and increases those shared hours, you're gonna to need to bill less of those direct support hours that you may have put in there for each person's flexibility. Next slide, please. If a person's need cannot be met through the flexible base hours that are provided with the overnight supervision, um, then you can request dedicated staff hours for each individual. The person-centered planning process should include discussion of the individual's support needs, talking about any kind of dedicated hours that they may need for health and safety and behavioral issues. Um, they also need to talk about dedicated supports um, in that house with other individuals. You also have to talk about the number of shared hours that are available in the home and what kind of overnight supports the home is going to have when you're doing your person-centered planning, those are important. So then the provider really needs to assess the need for their dedicated hours based on what the participants need is, the number of people that are in the home, and how many are supported by those shared hours. Your business model, how you are providing your overnight, is that uh, overnight supports asleep or awake? Is there a need for additional one-to-one -one awake persons because uh, in the home because somebody elopes during the middle of the night and you need um, a one-on-one -on -one for that person. Um, and your staffing models, you, uh, using overnight versus hiring dedicated staff. So that's really important for the providers to consider at each of these PCP meetings as they're looking at the residential staffing. Based on these considerations, a request for dedicated supports for additional hours can be made. People with high intense needs that have behavior plans, nursing care plans, or have an assessed need for a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one, dedicated supports can be added into the PCP with this documentation to verify the need. What you also need to know is that DDA's residential services can also use dedicated supports during a meaningful day whenever the one-to-one -one staff to participant supervision is needed. There are some times that a housemate may share staff. For example, if you have two people that are retired and they're both home, they can share a staff person. They don't have to each one have a one-to-one. -one. Different agencies are putting this into PCP different ways. Some people are splitting the hours. Some people are putting them on one person that is consistently at home and using that to bill. Some people are putting it on both folks and then billing for each one at a different time. You may have to make sure that as a provider, you are tracking who you're billing against and for when. Please um, note that there is a uh, residential dedicated supports policy that is noted at the end of this slide. 
or at the end of the slides that you can um, access if you need additional information. Finally, um, in DDA's guideline for service authorization and provider billing documentation, the additional dedicated hours can be used for community integration. So if you have somebody who goes out regularly every Tuesday night and their roommates don't want to go because it's not an activity that interests them, then you can request the dedicated supports for that individual for that time. So as you can see, there's very flexible options that can be done as you're looking at your person's residential services. It's also very important to consider their ADL assistance, um, their behavior plans, their nursing care plans, and their need to access their community for social, recreational, and individualized activities. Next slide, please. Some different scenarios to think about. If an individual has a bowling club that they go to once a week and it takes about four hours to support this community activity and the base or the shared hours are not available for them to do this, then the team should consider putting these direct support hours into the PCP so that the individual can do this community activity. If an individual needs direct support during their ADLs and it takes approximately two hours a day, seven days a week for this activity to be completed and there are not enough shared hours, then a team can add 14 direct support hours into this person's PCP and specify that it really is needed for their ADLs. If um, another example, if an individual can't go to a day program because it's 100 degrees out and they can't go out in the heat or it's icy and cold in the winter and they're not going anywhere, then, and there's no base shared hours left in the house, then you would expect that the team consider 30 hours of direct support hours in the plan so that you can bill for the services that you provide that individual when they are needed. If there is a roommate that is at home during these same times, then you can mark that under the direct support hours as shared supports in the SIP and in the outcome section of the PCP. Next slide, please. So some reminders, if a participant's need cannot be met through the residential service base hours and overnight supports that are available in that house, then you would request dedicated staffing hours. Overnight supports are provided unless you have contacted your regional office and had those services turned off on that house. Um, dedicated support hours are not limited to services inside the home. They are also available for supporting an individual in their community. Dedicated one-on-one -on -one hours cannot be authorized when the house reaches one-on-one -on -one supports for each participant living in that home. So whenever you reach one-on-one -on -one staffing for each person in that home, you cannot continue to ask for additional one-to-one -one staffing. There is no one left to staff at that point. Next slide, please. Thank you, Linda. I, you know, I think you gave some really good examples. So I'm just going to go straight to Karen and Jennifer to talk about their advice and how they went about identifying dedicated support. So Karen, we want to go to the next slide. Sure. Um, Donna, can you move us to the next slide? There Thank you go. You. Thanks. Um, so SEEK has been doing um, supported living since 1993 when it was called Community Supported Living Arrangements. Uh, when we transitioned, uh, you know, DDA transitioned to personal supports and then we continued to um, support people through that. But I think that DDA really has it right with this new supported living service. I think that it is a really great, um, it's a great service and it allows people to have choice and control in their life. So we support people with very significant support needs in this service. We don't own or rent anybody's home. Everybody owns or rents their own home. Um, and we support them to do that and support them in the maintenance of that in everything. Um, 
we just want to make sure that that people can um, choose where they live and who they live with and who supports them in their own home. So we have supported um, a handful of people also to, to, to purchase their own homes through like uh, county housing grants and other state grants. So just like all services, we want people to have the greatest amount of control in their lives. So we use the life course framework or uh, path and maps to help people to come into this service. So they're really defining what it is they want. I'll tell you that Amanda have um, lived at home with her mom who is an accountant and has that crazy accountant schedule this time of year. And her mom just made the assumption that she would move into a group home because she has such significant support needs. But we really walked her through what a life could look like for Amanda if she lived in her own place. And she lives in this really cool apartment near Metro so that we, we wanted her to live in a place that was attractive so that she could attract roommates that were her contemporaries. And we knew they didn't want to live off in the beaten path in an old kind of an old uh, apartment. We, want, we knew they'd want to live in something that was a little flashier. And um, her roommates that she's had through the course of the years have brought friends over, all who have to take their shoes off because Amanda scoots on the floor. Um, and we knew that this apartment was going to cost more, but having the roommate is such a cost savings that ultimately um, having a, a life like this uh, has been really great for Amanda. She is supported by staff that come in the evenings and the weekends to help her if she isn't with her family. And she has CDS during the day to do things like take classes and, and visit her friends. Um, you can see on here, we have three different kinds of supports that we do. Some people get overnight supports that are awake and, and some people get overnight staffing. Um, and then some people get no supports overnight. So really getting to know people in that pre-planning process, figuring out how they want to be supported. And as I said before, there are some folks that um, live together that may do a lot of stuff together, but they may go to different churches and they may need to have um, different types of, of support patterns and supports for the hours that are outside of um, what is covered in the course. And so we've added on additional supports in there through, um, uh, through the dedicated support model. And so Using the base numbers, we figure out what, a, what an average week is like, and we know it, it, it changes for people, but um, if we don't use the support that week, we actually don't bill for it. So you don't have to get it perfect when you're in the PCP process, because if you don't use it that week, because they both decided not to go to church and you didn't have that extra staff, or you're in between classes and, they, and they, they're not doing that, or you, you don't have to do the billing. Um, that's one of the really great things about having it as a separate uh, and having the dedicated supports as a separate uh, funding, so. Thank you. And Jennifer, you want to give us an overview and then we're going to run to the rest of the slides so that we can let you guys uh, go on time. Um, go ahead, sure. Jennifer. So as Karen mentioned, it re it is, um, there's options and that's that's really the name of the game for residential services as we're moving forward is being able to provide people options. So we're starting at Penmar to provide options of supported living um, for those that are looking um, to be able to live more independently or in their own homes or apartments. Um, the majority of our residential services are community living group homes. And whether somebody's living um, in a group home or they're utilizing the supported living service, it really it has become a major teaming process to figure out what are the specific factors that people need in terms of those additional dedicated hours, because this is something different. Um, you may have looked at them as the one-on-one -on -one add ons um, of the past and PCIS2, but it really goes far beyond that. And so you need that full teaming process as part of your PCP to ensure that you're really looking at the different types of support that someone might need that's specialized um, to them, whether it's supporting them in their communication, 
um, whether it's supporting them in activities of daily living um, or things of that nature. And so making sure you're going through a process and identifying those factors, you're really starting with the person. So instead of starting with staffing models of the home, like we might have done in the past, looking at each person's individualized needs first and then looking at, okay, what is our capacity as providers and how are we going to be able to do those dedicated hours? I think Linda had mentioned there's different ways to look at that, whether a team member is providing a certain amount of dedicated hours in this time period to one person, or they're providing them in, at another time period for the next person. It really depends on that compilation of needs for each of the people that live in the home to be able to assess how are you going to support those dedicated hours and do you have the, the capacity to do so? And, and certainly as we're really trying to help people individualize their schedules um, to a greater degree, if there's particular activities that they do in the community that their, their roommates are not doing, those dedicated hours can really come in handy to be able to support folks to do that. Um, the other thing, the, the big lesson learned, um, I think for us, is making sure you have a system in place to be able to track and monitor all of these dedicated hours. Because um, obviously they, they can't overlap in certain cases um, and you need to make sure that you're documenting what's happening and when is, are you able to actually utilize um, the amount of dedicated hours people have in their PCPs. To Karen's point, you don't have to utilize all of the hours. That's why you build in flexibility, but certainly you want to make sure that you have a very clear process um, and system to be able to do that. Prior, all we had to do was attendance in terms of people's residential supports. This does add an extra layer of complexity um, and the ability to be able to track that. Thank you, Jennifer. And I'm going to ask our audience if, if you can possibly stay about 10 more minutes, we'd appreciate it. We do understand that you may have other appointments um, already, but we really want to go over some of the next slides that talks about or stay funding. So um, let's walk through those. Um, if you can stay, please stay. If not, we are recording this and you can then use it, um, see it later on our website. So can um, we move on over then to our state funds? Uh, Linda? Sure, so in the past, um, some participants received state funded services through programs such as family support services and individualized support services known as FISS and ISS, um, which is one or more of those services that we worked really hard to unbundle in 2018. If somehow you missed that, then we definitely want to take a look at those PCPs as they're coming up and unbundling those services aligning those services that are directly matching with our waiver services and putting those in the PCP as such. Um, services that align should be unbundled and put in at the next um, revised PCP or the annual PCP, whichever comes first. Services that align directly with the waiver services should be indicated in the DSA with that service title. Um, that corresponds to the matching service title. So for example, if you are doing ISS with an individual and you are giving them personal supports, then when that is completed, it will go under personal supports in the DSA. Next slide, please. So state funded services um, are services that um, are not matched with our waiver. Some of the individuals who are receiving state funded services are supports only, um, or somebody who maybe was in a waiver and lost our eligibility with the waiver. So they are now receiving DDA state funded services rather than waiver services. 
for the individuals services that line directly with the waiver like i said you should be matching those up in the dsa um, with the service title that corresponds and put that into their pcp if an individual has fallen out of the waiver they need to reapply as soon as possible so that we can get that federal match some waiver participants are authorized as state only and those services that uh, match up with the waiver services are still listed as such and they are paid not through our waivers but um, these are services that have previously authorized so state-only funding is not something that we're giving a new um, new money out of these are previously authorized services that we are um, now matching to our waiver services and will continue to pay as state only but do not want to give out new funding because it's no longer available some of the state funded services that were um, could be noted in the DSA are camp non-respite state funded only whenever a camp is not approved or an out-of-state camp or unique circumstances that was authorized by DDA um, skilled nursing services our nursing support services are not skilled nursing services so that is something that could possibly be in a state only funded category and should be labeled as such rent individual supports um, that are state only funded for rent would go under that category we also have another category that's for anything else that DDA has authorized as state funded services. Next slide. DDA state funded program and state only funded services are only available to people that were previously authorized by DDA. This service much match the DDA authorized service to service amount. So if you were getting six hours of personal support in PCIS2, then you get six hours of personal support in LTSS. Um, it must also include um, in the outcome summary, um, a short description of the service so that we know what is being delivered. The services cannot be author over authorized. Um, so we had discussions last week about day services and how you can move through the different services. We cannot do that with folks that are state only funded. They really have to match service for service what was previously authorized. If there is a need for a change to move from one employment service to another one, then we would have to do a separate PCP authorization for that. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a DDA state funded program DSA for a person who is not in our waiver. So you'll notice up here that under the service plan, it shows that they are state funded. And then in the DSA, you can see that this person had personal supports and respite and employment. This person, um, it was supports only eligible, um, would be someone that would get a PCP like that. Also somebody who might be under the forensic category. Supports only eligible ind individuals are not able to put in those flexibilities that we talked about with respite and um, our employment services. The DSAs in these plans, like I said, do look the same as somebody who is in a waiver service. So the CCS would select the service title that corresponds to the matching service. And this example has the personal supports, respite, and employment. Next slide. This is a DSA of somebody that has state-only funded services in their DSA. So they may have um, waiver services as well, but certain things were put in the state funded category. So for this example, this person has waivered personal supports, but then they have other services that are in their state only funded category. 
These services are only available to participants that were previously authorized, and the services must be included in the outcome summary and include a short summary of exactly what those services are that are being delivered. Next slide, please. So the state does not receive any federal funding for people in DDA state funded programs or receiving state only funded services. So our CCSs need to support individuals who are currently um, have fallen out of the waiver in their path to waiver eligibility. Some folks have not met the waiver financial eligibility in the past and because they were over income or assets and they should um, have their CCS help them explore ABLE accounts and trust funds. Next slide, please. All right, so then we have some specific guidance related, related to self-directed services. Um, Self-directed budget allocations are based on the service units listed in the PCP um, in the detailed service authorization section using the same fully loaded rates that providers receive. So people self-directing services have employer and budget authority over their staff and their self-directed budget funding. This means that once authorized, they have the flexibility to schedule services anytime during the year or to authorize payment regardless of the month that it's noted in, in the PCP and the DSA. So to prevent over-authorization of funding, it's important to understand that these are the actually actual assessed needs for units and they are not, um, to exceed the service limits. So these individuals can only have 40 hours a week of day services as noted in our waiver. Next. So there you can see our meaningful day services um, cannot exceed the 40 hours a week. Our behavior um, support services truly are a projection of their annual needs. Um, and then respite services cannot go over the 720 hours. Next slide, please. Personal supports. So the detailed service authorization should reflect but not exceed the assessed hours that are needed per week for the person. So per DDA guidance, the scope section should reflect the services and supports that um, are the approved waiver services and the recommended requirements that are outlined in the service implementation plan, the behavior plan or the nursing care plan unless otherwise noticed in policy or guidance. So we're seeing plans with staff schedules, pay rates, benefits amounts, um, staff hours per week, taxes, backup vendors, and other information which is not supposed to be in the scope section. So if you are doing a self-directed plan, those inform that information should all be in the service implementation plan area, not in the scope. Um, backup staff and vendors would replace the primary staff person and therefore should not have additional hours added into the plan as it over authorizes the person's budget. Next slide, please. This is an example of a self-directed plan that the scope had every detail in. It had the staff schedule, the pay rates, the benefits, and it's just too much information in the scope section. It's not what we would like to have in there. That information all needs to go in the service implementation plan. And the scope should really talk about what the service is and what um, the need is for the individual at that point. So this is an example of what not to do for a scope in a self-directed plan. 
Next slide, please. These are the links to last week's webinar where we shared the person-centered planning service considerations and flexibilities related to meaningful day services and community integration. Next slide, please. The DDA person-centered planning webpage includes a variety of resources and tools to assist teams with developing a robust PCP. The PCP checklist includes some of the necessary information to support both federal and state requirements, demonstrate assessed need for requested DDA services, and support the participant's health and safety needs in order to be processed efficiently. The PCP review checklist tool is not an exhaustive list, but it is required to be used in conjunction with existing DDA service authorization and provider billing documentation guidance for the DDA programs, policies, and procedures to ensure consistent and efficient processing of PCPs. If a CCS agency is using their own checklist, it must include all of the DDA required elements. Please also review DDA service and topic specific policies and policy staff, including requirements associated with the service implementation plan or SIP. If an agency has created or is using a software vendor's version of the SIP, it needs to mirror the DDA form. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. And, and we really apologize that we could not do um, um, questions, but we're going to gather all your questions. Um, Rhonda, did you want to close us out? Yeah, thank you, Patricia. And again, thank you to um, everybody that was able to join us today and hang on to the end. Thank you to our presenters um, and Linda and uh, Rachel for sharing and going through the information and sharing our service considerations and um, flexibilities. As Patricia said, we are um, looking at both the questions from last week and this week, and we will be um, um, organizing them for um, consideration inclusion in our frequently asked documents um, that will also be posted on the DDA website. So wishing you all well, have a great weekend. And again, thank you for joining us.